joining us um, during the next five minutes. So welcome everyone. This event is um, organized, hosted by the IEEE Buena Ventura section. And we are co-hosting this event also with Central, Central Coast uh, section. Um, and this section covers the area St. Louis Obispo to Santa Barbara. Um, an honor to co-host with you. So to, today we're exploring uh, electrical vehicle technology and its implications on climate change. Uh, this program is made possible by the support of the IEEE Foundation and is part of our speaker series that we have been running for about a year on engineering resilience to drought and wildfires. And we're tackling the topic from different angles. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to our um, great speaker. Momin Kudus is an IEEE senior member. He's the section chair of the IEEE Buena Ventura section. Um, Momin's volunteer contributions are so many to our sections over the past 20 years. And I have always been so grateful for um, the contributions that Momin has brought to our section. Momin professionally works at NASA GPL in radar science section. He's a professional engineer. He has worked in avionics, wireless communications, and aerospace industries for over 30 years. He holds a patent on wireless antenna design. He received a BSWE from University of Texas and an MSWE degree from Florida Atlantic University. He's interested in analyzing topics in terms of economics and analytics, and this amazing talent has been so beneficial to our speaker programs over the past few years. Thank you, Momin. On the side, Momin enjoys playing tennis, field hockey, and soccer. He coaches youth sport teams. He volunteers at youth outreach events such as science fairs and academic decathlon. It's, it is such a great pleasure for me to have you as a speaker tonight, Momin, as part of this. IEEE Foundation Speaker Series. Welcome. Can you hear me okay? You need to raise the, the sound. Can you hear me okay now? Can you go a little bit louder? Do I have control over the microphone? Yeah, is this something you can control, Darren? Is this? Uh, no. Um, you were uh, you were okay, moment. You might have to speak a little bit louder than normal. Sorry. Very good. Uh, All right. Yeah, let me try that. Uh, hopefully, everyone everyone can hear me. It's uh, good. Thank, Very good. Thank you, thank All you, right. Natalie, for a kind introduction, and thank you all for joining this uh, talk. Now, before I begin, I will wear my section chair hat for a minute. And uh, okay. so IEEE uh, is one of the largest uh, professional organization uh, in the world, I believe. Um, our local section is called IEEE Buena Our uh, mission is to enhance the careers of our members. We do that through improving our members' knowledge in technologies through technical talks. So this is one of them. Uh, we hold mixers for networking. So if you are interested, you can go to the website, IEEEBB.org, 
and uh, we have a schedule of our mixers there. Uh, we uh, help our members to find employment opportunities. So in our website, we have a jobs uh, section where you can find uh, advertisements uh, from local companies for uh, engineering jobs. And we also have uh, the link to the portal of IEEE Central, where there are literally thousands of jobs. So uh, feel free to uh, take advantage of that resource. Uh, we also provide a platform uh, for our members to contribute to our community. So uh, uh, recently we uh, are going to be having an event uh, called Girls Meet Tech. And I'm sure we need volunteers for that. So please visit our website and you'll find more information on that. So moving on, today's talk will be uh, electronic vehicles, technology and its implication on climate change. Before I begin, I would like to take care of some of the logistics. Um, this meeting is open to all of you. So each one of you have the ability to unmute yourself and ask questions. However, I request that you mute yourself so we don't get background noise. I have quite a bit, quite a few slides. So every few slides, I will pause for a Q&A section. So at that point, you can unmute yourself, ask your question, and then mute yourself. If you feel shy to ask questions, uh, verbally then you can also send the questions via chat and thereon will read it out for me so uh, with that move on so lately uh, in last decade or two there's been significant interest in electronic vehicles there has been interest in evs from various segments of our economy the interests have been from consumers uh, these are the consumers who want to uh, drive a stylish electric car, or they like the convenience of being able to charge at home, or uh, some just want to be environmentally friendly. Uh, environmental activists um, have been interested in EVs also because EVs provide a sustainable future to our civilization. So they are also promoting EV ownership among the public. Uh, there has been significant interest among investors uh, because of um, profit, uh, profit uh, opportunities. So uh, Tesla is a good example. Tesla is one of the uh, largest uh, EV manufacturer. Its market valuation is larger than all the traditional uh, car manufacturers. So Tesla has experienced several hundred percent of growth in terms of valuation. So at this moment, Tesla's market valuation is larger than uh, Volkswagen, and it is also larger than Toyota, which are the two of the largest traditional uh, automobile manufacturers. There's also been interest among government officials. Now the government wants to provide incentives to the uh, consumers so they own electric vehicles. So they have been providing uh, incentives like uh, the HOV plane access. Uh, another example is uh, Federal government has uh, has a tax incentive where if you buy an EV, you get a tax refund. Uh, local governments are also doing that. Now, from a government point of view, uh, the promotion of EV can be um, uh, conflicting in some places. Uh, a good example is Texas, where uh, Texas is a very large um, oil manufacturer, but also their electricity cost is very low. So there, the oil industry wants to uh, 
sell more oil, so they don't want EVs to uh, replace the traditional vehicles. Whereas the uh, whereas it makes all the sense for people to own EVs because the electricity is so cheap. So that is an interesting uh, conflict that is happening in some states. Um, another good example is Hawaii. Hawaii has uh, no oil resource. They have to import oil via ships, so gasoline is very expensive. However, uh, Hawaii has plenty of geothermal energy, so they can produce cheap electricity. So EVs for them makes perfect sense. So they are uh, aggressively promoting EV ownership. Moving on, in this lecture, we will go over automotive technologies. We will cover fuel and energy. We will go over environmental impact. And lastly, we'll go over financial opportunities. EV definition. An electric, electric vehicle is a vehicle that uses one or more electric motors or traction motors for propulsion. This is according to Wikipedia. This is a traditional definition. There are other types of vehicles that employ electric motors. These are hybrid cars, plug-in hybrid, and hydrogen cars. There is some history about EVs. First electric car was built by a French engineer named Gustave Thoux in 1881. There is a picture on the right of the vehicle. It was a trike with a big, large engine connected to an electric motor on the left. Now, uh, in 1899, Belgium vehicle La, I think Natalie will be able to pronounce it better, La Jame Fantastique, was the first electric car to reach 100 kilometer per hour. It is the picture of that vehicle. The lunar roving vehicle, LRV, is the most well-known electrical vehicle to date. It was driven in moon surface. It was the most popularly, it was most popularly known as moon buggy. Here's a picture of that. In uh, in the early 1900s, there was a car company called Beardsley Electric Cars. They had built a fleet of electric cars, which gained a lot of pop popularity with the ladies. And the reason being is that back then, the gasoline cars needed a crankshaft. And crankshaft was very dangerous, and it was hard for ladies to turn. So they, were, they uh, migrated towards electric cars. Uh, here, there is a picture. Uh, of a Beersley electric car rally in 1999 for ladies in Long Beach. Uh, so in the 1920s, uh, Cadillac installed electric starters in its cars, uh, which solved that crankshaft issue. So electric cars uh, lost its appeal to the ladies and slowly Beersley uh, went bankrupt. So this is an example of a destructive technology. So electric starter was a destructive technology which essentially destroyed the electric market back in the early 1900s. So next few slides, we'll go over automotive technology. A gasoline vehicle. Um, the technical name for gasoline vehicle is, is ICEV, electronic, electric internal Combustion engine vehicle is the, uh, is the definition of the acronym. So here is a picture of a ICE drivetrain, or uh, electric combustion engine drivetrain. So it consists of an engine, a gasoline engine. It consists of a clutch, a transmission, a, a drive shaft or a propeller shaft, a differential, the rear axle and wheels. Some definitions of the parts, uh, engine. Engine converts 
energy in fuel to rotational mechanical motion. Transmission. Transmission converts torque and speed of rotational motion of the engine axle to the required torque and speed of the wheel axle. Differential. Differential is an interesting uh, piece of uh, equipment that most of us uh, don't understand and don't know about. Differential splits the torque from the transmission between two wheels. So this allows the two wheels to spin independently at different speeds. So that is very important. In some of the race cars, they actually weld, weld the, uh, take the differential out so they can, uh, there's no energy lost there. And you will see when uh, those uh, drag racers turn, their wheels smoke. And that is because of that, because their two wheels are welded together. So uh, they're trying to turn at the same time while, they're, while the vehicle is taking a turn. So the inside wheel smokes because it's trying to spin at the same speed as the outside wheel. Wheels, wheels carry the weight of the car. They also spin to move the car forward or backward. Here is a cutout of the internal combustion engine. So internal combustion engine essentially has a cylinder, uh, cylinder piston mechanism, and it moves back and forth, which drives a uh, camshaft, and then the camshaft then drives the axle. So on a uh, the first thing that happens is that the piston opens. So as piston is opening, a fuel air mixture is injected into the piston. And when the uh, piston is open all the way, the chamber is full of fuel air mixture. Then the uh, piston compresses, piston starts closing, and as it starts closing, it compresses the fuel air mixture into um, uh, several 140, I think is the, about the number, 10 times the air pressure. Uh, so it compresses the fuel air mixture to 10 times the uh, pressure of uh, atmosphere. At that point, the fuel air mixture gets hot and becomes ready to combust. The spark plug sparks the, uh, creates a spark, which ignites the fuel air mixture. So that creates uh, a uh, thermal and expansion energy that forces the piston open. That's where the energy comes from, or the, the force comes from that turns the wheel. So the piston expands and uh, it does the work of turning the wheel. And then on the following stroke, the valve, the exhaust valve opens, piston closes again. And as the piston closes, it pushes out the um, used um, exhaust, used air in the form of exhaust and then cycle begins again. Here is a picture of an electric power chain. Electric power chain consists of a battery, a DC to DC converter, a DC link, an inverter, a motor, and a transmission, and the wheels. So in an electric motor, uh, the transmission and the differential is uh, usually combined, which saves some weight. Uh, in electric motor, the inverter is a big part of the drivetrain because it has to take the DC current and convert it into some type of a uh, alternating current to drive the motors. And we'll go over the latest uh, motor technology in a few slides. Okay, EV parts description, battery. Battery stores energy in the form of electric charge. Electric motor, motor converts energy in the form of charge in the battery to a rotational mechanical motion. Transmission, transmission converts torque and speed of rotational motion of engine axle to the required torque and speed of wheel axle. Differential, differential is the same. Differential splits the torque from the transmission between two wheels. This allows the two wheels to spin independently at different speeds. Wheels, wheels carry the weight of the car. They also spin to move the car forward and backwards. 
those two things are the same. Actually, these things are the same, these three, the last three are the same for the two types of technology. Here is a um, cutout of a electric vehicle. So it shows that the engine is here, charging. You can see the relative size of the battery. When in electric cars, battery is a big portion of the volume and the weight. And that's where a lot of uh, improvement needs to happen in order for an electric car to perform as well as a gasoline car. It is a um, uh, cutout of a four wheel uh, electric vehicle. So in a four wheel electric, electric vehicle, you can see the motors are like really tiny, small. Uh, and it has a transmission and differential here that can be connected directly to the real axle. So you can see the size of an electric motor and transmission is very small. And by um, by connecting this, I'm hearing some background noise. If you can mute that person. Uh, well, okay. okay. So you can see the, uh, the electric uh, motors are much smaller than combustion engine, uh, combustion engine motors and uh, transmission. And um, th this is one of the advantages that uh, we can do with ele electric vehicles is that you can put small motors in, uh, and make the car four wheel drive, which, uh, is, which gives better traction in slippery conditions at the same time it is possible to turn off one motor and just uh, ride on this uh, the one motor during high speeds so uh, to save energy and and when a car needs to accelerate from stop then all four can be used to accelerate fast uh, there is a third type of vehicle uh, which is called a hybrid a lot of us own those uh, Prius is one of those uh, ubiquitous hybrids that we see everywhere. So hybrids uh, consist of an electric ICE engine and an EV engine. So it has a uh, ICE engine, and then it has a traction motor connected to the same axle. So this is a traditional um, hybrid. And then they share a track, uh, sh they share an axle, and then it goes to uh, that axle goes to a differential, and then that turns the wheel. So hybrid vehicles have electric and combustion engines. Each engine is used to drive the wheel at speed where they are most efficient. Hybrid cars have onboard generators driven by combustion engines. When combustion engine is idling, it drives the generator to charge the batteries. Hybrid vehicles have regenerative braking. When brakes are applied, electric engine is rotated by the wheels, turning it into an electric generator. The electricity generated charges the batteries. Here's a cutout of a BMW i8 hybrid car. So BMW decided to do it differently. So their design is a little bit non-traditional. So what they did was they put the electric engine to draw uh, in the front wheel. So they drive the, uh, they use the electric engine to drive the front wheel and they put the uh, turbo uh, ice engine to drive the rear wheel. So they can use both of them to accelerate fast and then uh, selectively turn on and off one or the other uh, depending on the, the drive conditions. All right, now we are coming to the Q&A, are there any questions? Marvin, this is John Wright. One of the things you said was the, um, the ice or the, uh, the electric vehicles have transmissions in them and most of them do not, some do, but most do not. Most are direct drive from the motors. 
Tunnel combustion engine? No, on the electric vehicles. That, that's one of the simplifications from uh, an ICE to an electric vehicle is there really isn't a transmission. Um, you are you're right. Um, there is a, um, there has to be some kind of a conversion and it's not a, a transmission in a traditional sense, but they still they have to do torque, torque conversion and speed conversion. But it is much simplified. So you are right that it doesn't have a transmission in a traditional sense. However, and we will go over some charts. Uh, however, it's, it still needs some, um, I guess, speed and torque conversion. Any other questions? There's a comment in the chat from Earl that it's a, a, a reduction gear. That's simplified. Any other questions? Eighty slides, so I have to kind of move fast. Okay, some definitions. Torque. Torque is defined as rotational force. The unit of torque is Newton meter in metric system. Pound force foot in English system. Rotational speed. Rotational speed is defined as the speed at which axle turns. Unit of rotational speed is RPM, or rotation per minute. Example, closest example to our everyday life is turning a screwdriver. So torque is how hard you turn a screwdriver. Speed is how fast you turn the screwdriver. Horsepower is a measure of power. Horsepower is a measure of rate at which the work is done. The HP is equivalent to lifting 33 pounds, uh, one foot in one minute. Torque requirements for a car. So this chart shows a typical torque requirement of a vehicle. So when the car is, uh, the vertical axis is the torque and the horizontal axis is the RPM of the, of the engine. So when a car is stationary, and it wants to start going, it needs the maximum amount of torque with very low rotational speed. As it speeds up to say 70 miles an hour, its torque requirements goes down, but its rotational speed requirement goes up. So it needs less torque, but at higher speeds, higher RPM. Now here is a torque versus speed chart of a internal combustion engine. So internal combustion his, uh, ha engine has a couple of features or disadvantages. One of them is that it can, uh, when it's in operation mode, it has to idle. So it has to idle around 800 to 1000 RPM. And when at, it's at low speeds, its torque output is very low. Now, as it speeds up, as it speeds up, its torque output goes up. And then when it goes beyond a certain speed, like 4,000 RPM, then its uh, torque output goes down again. So there are several disadvantages to that. Like if, if you are a, a roadster and you want to go from, say, uh, 50 miles an hour, and you want to accelerate and pass someone on the freeway, and you hit the gas, you're already operating at 4,000 RPM and you want torque, at that point, combustion engine is not very good at providing torque. And similarly, when you are stationary and you want to start, combustion engine doesn't provide very good torque at lower RPM. So it has to speed up and the transmission has to um, gear it down or the, reduce the speed to increase torque. And that's how they get torque. Okay, so torque versus speed curve for electric motor. So this is a plot of an elect, uh, torque versus speed of electric motor. The left uh, vertical axis is torque in Newton meters. The horizontal axis is um, RPM. And for electric motor, it has really high torque. Its torque output is very high at lower RPMs and at higher RPMs, it goes down. So now you can see that the torque output of electric motor 
almost perfectly matches the torque requirement of a vehicle. So that is where the advantage is coming. Another advantage is it has, it has no idle speed. So when the electric motor is at zero RPM, it can generate significant torque to get the car going. So there is no waste of energy. So this is a, a Tesla cutout of a Tesla electric motor. And uh, there are several motor technologies. I think most of us in this forum are electrical engineers. So we've studied motors and energy conversion courses. Um, so there are DC motors, electric motor, uh, AC motors, and there's some hybrid motors in between. Um, so um, in, in the electric uh, vehicle space, the electric car companies have made significant improvements in the traditional motor technology. And this is one of the latest uh, Tesla motor technology. They call it IPM Sync RM electric motor. So this is kind of a um, hybrid between a DC and an AC motor. So uh, back in the day, where, when we had DC motors, the DC motors that we studied, the the um, the coil or the windings were in the rotor. Um, some definitions, a motor consists of a stator and a rotor. So stator is the outside part and the rotor is the inside part. So uh, in the old days, uh, in a traditional DC motor, the coils were on the um, rotor and uh, the magnets were on the stator. The energy, the electricity had to be injected into the coil through brushes. And then the brushes had a um, uh, stator filament, which had alternating currents. So as the brushes moved from um, one section to the other, the polarity of the electricity would change, which would change the field, which would make it rotate. That caused uh, quite a few issues. One issue was that uh, the brushes would wear down. So I don't know how many of you remember, but motors had to be serviced every so, every so often. They would be sent in and they would switch the uh, brushes off. Now, in, in uh, the Tesla motors, what they did was they, they made the rotor um, winding free. So they, they uh, placed some slots on the rotor to uh, to shape the magnetic field, uh, and they also uh, placed some permanent magnets in the rotor. Now the windings are on the stator, as you can see, the windings are on the stator. And what they do is uh, they in, uh, they create a magnetic field in the in the stator, which, which uh, is misaligned with the magnetic field generated by the rotor. So what that does is that it generates a um, torque on the rotor and makes it turn. So the rotor tries to align itself to the magnetic field generated by the, by the stator. So as it tries to align, the, um, the magnetic field is rotated. So magnetic field essentially rotates and the rotor follows. So what that does is that has a few advantages. One advantage is that now the electricity or uh, electricity does not have to be injected into a moving part. So it's essentially brushless. It's basically floating in the air and the magnetic field is turning it. And the other advantage is that uh, the Rotor doesn't have any coils, so so it is less prone to failure. Now, with the uh, invention of super magnets, um, this has uh, become possible and more efficient. Okay, Tesla chassis with electric drivetrain. So this. Uh, uh, 
picture shows a typical Tesla chassis and they, Tesla calls it the skateboard. So here you have a chassis, which essentially consists of battery and we have suspension, transmission differential, the transmission differential is here, the motor is here. Right. Any questions so far? Uh, Moment, there's a question from Lawrence, uh, who is actually in the uh, Alberta, Canada, Southern Alberta, Canada section. Uh, how is the performance of EVs on ice and in cold weather? So there has been some complaints about EVs not working as well in cold weather, but uh, you know uh, we have to define cold because there is co uh, in cold weather the uh, traditional gasoline engines have or used to have issues also. So uh, those problems are getting solved, but yeah, so EV has some issues. I don't own an EV, so I don't know what the issues are, but yes. I have read that EVs have some issues in cold weather. Any other questions? I think Earl is a uh, EV owner. Maybe he, he can say a couple of words. Sure, I was putting it in the chat, but I guess I'll just speak here. Yes, Earl Cox. Um, yeah, they, they handle uh, EVs actually generally handle much better on ice than gas cars just because they have such precise torque. They can back off immediately if they sense any kind of slip. So the, the handling of a, a well designed EV is much, much better than a, a gasoline car. Also, the weight, ba weight balance on it is usually a lot better. It depends what kind you drive, but sorry, the Teslas have really good weight distribution. So they handle really, really well on ice, much better than any, even better than a two wheel drive uh, EV will generally handle better than a four wheel drive gas car. Now, the, uh, the other question about the cold weather. Cold weather is definitely an issue. The gasoline engine runs so inefficiently, there's so much leftover heat that gets used to heat the engine that the cold weather doesn't, well, let's just say that the engines do okay in the cold weather. The problem is that it's the heating of the car that hurts the most in the electric car because you're using battery to heat the car as opposed to just driving the engine like the gasoline engine would. So they do have a reduced uh, range in, uh, in cold weather, but they handle it just fine. Thank you, good information. So here is a uh, comparison of electric uh, versus mechanical drivetrain. So you can see the electric drivetrain is tiny, it's small, there's a small motor with a small uh, transmission differential combo. Same here. Whereas you see in a, a mechanical or an internal combustion engine, you get a massive engine with a massive transmission and differential and so on and so forth. Okay, here's a um, weight comparison between electric and mechanical drivetrain. The electric motor weighs about 60 to 80 pounds. The uh, elect ice motor weighs about 300 to 500 pounds. Electric uh, transmission or the uh, down, down converter, I think that's what Earl said, or down, uh, weighs about 10 to 200 pounds, whereas a, a mechanical or the ice uh, transmission weighs 200 to 400 pounds. The differentials weigh about the same. Inverter is one of the new things that electric motors need that ice motors don't have, uh, which is the electronics that uh, converts the DC to AC and um, can, uh, and drives the motor. Battery is the big enchilada in uh, like EVs. It weighs about 1,200 pounds. Compare that with gas plus tank, uh, uh, more energy probably, uh, weighs only 135 pounds. So this is where most of the research is going to improve. EVs. Fuel cycle for ice. So um, ice runs on gasoline. Gasoline can be made uh, from crude oil or biofuels. And gasoline um, is used by the engine to turn the wheels, and then wheels turn the motion. 
Okay, a fuel cycle of EV. EV needs electricity. So electricity can be generated with wind, solar, can be generated with generators driven by fossil fuel or biofuels. And the electricity is um, used to charge the batteries and the batteries drive the motors, motors drive the wheels, wheels create motion. Hydrogen fuel cell. So on a hydrogen wake EV, uh, the fuel is hydrogen. Hydrogen can be generated many different ways. So hydrogen can be generated from fossil fuels with an electrolyzer and electricity. Hydrogen can also be generated from water and electricity. And then the electricity can be generated with fossil fuel or renewable sources. So in the vehicle, hydrogen is mixed with oxygen in a type of electrolyzer, which generates electricity. And then that electricity drives the motor, the motor drives the wheels, and then wheels create motion. Any questions? Okay, moving on. Fuel and energy. Gasoline. Yes, gasoline is ex extracted from crude oil. It is a type of fossil fuel. Most ICE automobiles use gasoline as fuel. Electricity generated from burning fossil fuel or nuclear or alternate energy. Alternate energy consists of wind, geothermal, solar, biofuels, hydroelectric, and ocean. Hydrogen, hydrogen is generated by splitting water or fossil fuels with electrolyzers. Electrolyzers use electricity. So here's a chart which shows the crude oil reserves. So uh, if you look at the reserves, the largest uh, reserve lies in Venezuela followed by Saudi Arabia, Canada, Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, UAE, Russia, Libya. So US is pretty low in the ranking, we are number 10. Now here, this is where it is interesting. At the current rate of extraction, this is the number of years of reserve that is left. So looking at this, one sobering reminder to all of us is in United States, we only have 10 years worth of proven reserve left. So the United States will run out of oil in 10 years, that is within our lifetime. So uh, to take away from this is that oil is a finite resource. It will run out sometime soon. So crude oil to gas extraction efficiency is about 20.5%. So this is where it shows the crude oil cycle. So starting out, oil or crude oil in the ground has 100 megajoules of energy, I'm just using a number. Lose, they lose 10 megajoules in uh, extraction. 27 megajoules is lost in refining. Five megajoules is lost in transport. 37.5 megajoules is lost in um, infrastructure and transport. So the remaining out of 100 is 20.5 megajoules. Energy return on energy investment, E-R-O-E-I. This is a term used by energy experts, which essentially means is how much energy you need to put in to get how much energy out to the ratio. So in Middle Eastern oil, for every barrel of oil, uh, for 30 barrel of oil extraction, you need one barrel of oil worth of energy. For shale oil in Colorado, Wyoming, the ratio is three to one. So to get three barrels of oil, we have to burn one barrel of oil. Heavy oil like Venezuela, Canada, it's seven to one ratio. Deep sea offshore is three to one ratio. Abandoned wells is 20 to one ratio. Efficiency of engines. Efficiency is calculated by mechanical energy divided by energy in fuel multiplied by 100. For an internal combustion engine, the efficiency is 33 to 36%. For diesel engines, which is also an ICE engine, 
is 40 to 44 percent, but it's very dirty. For electric motor, it's 97 percent. That's the Tesla claim. Units of energy and power. Energy uh, units of energy is joules calorie. Units of power is watts or joules per second. Um, kilowatt hours, uh, kilowatts is the units of power. Kilowatt hours is the uh, unit of energy. A hundred watt bulb left on for 10 hours will consume one kilowatt hour of energy. So this chart shows electric power generation efficiency. Uh, coal power plants are here at 45%. Uh, gas turbines are here at about 38%. Nuclear fission is out here at about 30, 35%. Gas, electricity, and battery. One gallon of gas contains 33.7 kilowatt hour of energy. One gallon of gas weighs six pounds. One gallon of gas costs $3.35 in California and $2.50 in Texas. It's changed now. 33.7 kilowatt hour of energy at 18 cents per kilowatt hour costs about six dollars. So a 33.7 kilowatt hour battery weighs 475 pounds. So the reason I threw that in was that uh, a gallon of gas, which weighs six pounds, uh, has 33.7 kilowatts of energy. If we were to store that energy in a battery, that battery weighs almost 500 pounds. Any questions? Okay, moving on. Uh, moment, there is a, a question from uh, Noli. I apologize if I get the name wrong. Uh, so what you're saying is that ice efficiency from crude oil to movement is about 10%? Talking about this? Um, I'm not so sure. This 33 to 36% is the energy in the fuel to mechanical uh, energy retrieved. So if we use 100 joules of gasoline energy, we will get approximately 35 joules of mechanical energy to move the car forward. Rest of it is lost in heat. I think that should answer the question, but I'm kind of running behind schedule, so I'll move on. So this show this chart shows the cost breakdown in uh, per kilowatt hours. So we can see that uh, the cost of photovoltaic is the highest per kilowatt hour. Uh, hydro and geothermal is in the low end, and all the traditional, uh, traditional like coal and natural gas, they're somewhere in between. Okay, this chart shows the mix of power generation from different fuels. So we are still generating 38% of our fuel by burning coal, which is the dirtiest form of energy. Uh, nuclear is 10%, and uh, here we are at 16% with the renewables. So this chart shows the specific energy, energy density, and CO2 emissions. So, uh, so this uh, column shows the specific energy per uh, kilojoule per gram. Uh, Energy density is kilowatt hour per gallon. This is in volumes. This is a chemical formula. And uh, what we can take away from this is that gasoline and diesel and oil, they have the uh, highest energy emissions per gallon or highest CO2 emissions per gallon. And they also contain the largest amount of energy in terms of volume and wait. So only thing good here 
is hydrogen by kilojoule per gram uh, specific energy, but energy density in terms of volume is not very good, but it creates uh, no CO2 per gallon. So this chart shows the specific energy of fuels compared to battery. So you can see here, the horizontal axis is different types of fuels and the vertical axis is the uh, specific energy. And you can see that the battery technology like lead acid, nickel metal hydride, lithium ion, their uh, specific energy is very low compared to um, gasoline or hydrogen. Hydrogen is the highest. Volumetric energy density of uh, fuels and battery. So this is another interesting chart. I won't go over it. So I am running behind schedule. So this shows the energy stored in terms of uh, different fuel by megajoules per kilogram. You can see hydrogen is in the top, gasoline is number two, diesel is number three. And the batteries are way down here. Any questions? Okay, moving on, battery technology. This is the latest uh, uh, lithium ion battery technology. When a lithium ion battery, there is the anode and the cathode. Anode is made out of carbon, um, carbon fibers, the carbon polymer. It has a polymer uh, partition. And then uh, the cathode is made out of nickel magnesium cobalt oxide. It has a lithium, uh, it's immersed in a lithium uh, fluid. Lithium ions are charged. They migrate through this uh, polymer separator and reside or are trapped or held in carbon fiber. And then when we drain the battery, the charge, uh, the electrons flow this way and then back. The latest in uh, battery technology, which is getting a lot of buzz in the Wall Street is solid state batteries. So idea behind solid state battery is that instead of a polymer separator, they are going to use a, separ a ceramic separator. And then they are going to use, uh, the, remove the carbon uh, fibers. Uh, this would result in, uh, in a smaller volume so that should increase the uh, volumetric density of the battery. Uh, supposedly, according to their um, literature, it is faster to charge also. So the idea is that uh, the lithium ion uh, ions, when they are charged, uh, in a traditional lithium ion, they migrate through this polymer layer to the carbon anode, in this particular case, they will uh, migrate through a ceramic separator and then get deposited in this gap. So the battery would essentially expand uh, slightly and then it will contract when the charge is depleted. All right, battery form factor, Tesla uh, lithium ion versus GM ultium. So Tesla has stayed with uh, the traditional form factor, which is cylindrical and they have been uh, changing the form factor of the cylinder uh, to increase the capacity. Uh, whereas GM has come up with a new form factor where their batteries are um, rectangular, so they're stacked like this. So GM has uh, proposed an interesting uh, model for batteries. So they are saying that they're going to make batteries in this form factor, which will be stackable inside cars, and then once the batteries are, uh, have lost their charge holding capacity below 70%, they can take those batteries and install them in the um, large scale utility storage sites. So they can reuse these batteries in, as utility batteries. Any questions? All right, moving on. So battery life versus the depth of charge. This is another interesting chart. 
uh, most of us don't realize is that if you charge a battery, uh, if you charge and discharge a battery uh, too deep, meaning that if you discharge the battery all the way down to zero, then the number of cycle that we can get out of it goes down. So something for all of us to know because we own phones and uh, you don't want your phone to go down to single bar or red because every time you do that, you're reducing the number of cycle it can take. So ideally, you want to stay below zero So every 50%. A chart that shows the battery gravimetric energy density versus volumetric energy density. So we can see the lithium polymers and lithium ion batteries are the best among batteries. And the lead acid is the worst, which is done here. Okay, battery technology, future work. So at this point, we are about here and they are pushing the curve up to get here. The, the experts are saying that if we get here, the battery will be um, good enough to be used in airplanes. So there is a huge push to get here. All right, summary, electric motors are more efficient in converting energy to mechanical motion than ice are converting energy in gasoline to mechanical motion. Generation of electricity has a large carbon footprint if generated from fossil fuels. EVs and ICEV have similar footprint if electricity is generated from fossil fuels. Pollution can be shifted away from populated areas by replacing ICEV EVs with EVs. Any questions? So, a uh, moment, a uh, question from Lawrence. Uh, lithium is or was considered a dangerous material because it is on the side of the periodic table that reacts vigorously with water. Are these guidelines being relaxed to allow lithium batteries to be used in more applications? Lithium is a solid, a dangerous material, and that is uh, because it can store a lot of energy. And, uh, and that is why it's such a good material to be used in batteries. Um, I don't believe, to my knowledge, I don't believe that the, uh, the requirements are being relaxed. It's just the technology is getting better to make them safe. Okay, so next section will cover climate change and CO2 emissions. Atmospheric uh, composition. So according to NASA, the atmospheric atmosphere of Earth uh, has 78% uh, nitrogen, 21% oxygen, 0.93% argon, and 0.04% carbon dioxide. 0.04% uh, is 400 ppm. So that's a number uh, to remember. And then the other thing, other uh, gases in the atmosphere are neon, helium, methane, krypton, hydrogen, and as well as water vapor. Greenhouse effects. So this picture shows uh, how um, the greenhouse effect works. So, um, so we receive, the Earth receives uh, solar radiation or heat from uh, through infrared, which enters our atmosphere. Now, majority of it is absorbed. Some of it is reflected back. Um, in the reflection, the uh, ice caps play a major role because they're white, so they reflect a lot of energy. So if we lose ice caps, we lose that reflectivity of the Earth's surface. Now, a lot of the energy is reflected back into space, but if there are greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, that if uh, they reflect the uh, reflected energy from the surface back into the uh, Earth's surface, so which results in the heating of the atmosphere. Okay. 
Okay, some gasoline facts. And gasoline is uh, derived by refining crude oil. I think we went through that. One barrel of crude, which is 42 gallons, yields 19 gallons of gasoline. Uh, gasoline consists of 150 different types of hydrocarbons, including ben butane, pentane, isopentane, and alkane. It also can uh, contains BTEX compounds, which are benzene, ethylene benzene, toluene, and xylene. These chemicals are known to cause cancer. Gasoline can also contain sulfur and other impurities. Gasoline plus oxygen generates heat, CO2, carbon monoxide, nitrous oxide, sulfur oxide, water, and unburned hydrocarbons. One gallon of gasoline creates 19.5 pounds of CO2 when burned. 1.139 billion tons of CO2 is released due to gasoline combustion. Oxygen is a resource. Oxygen is essential for the survival of all animal life, including humans. Free oxygen has not been detected in any planet other than Earth. A human consumes 13.3 cubic feet of oxygen per day. Burning one gallon of gasoline consumes 178 cubic feet of oxygen, which is 14.6 pounds. So burning one gallon of ga gas consumes enough oxygen that will sustain a human life for 13 days. carbon dioxide emissions and atmospheric CO2. So this is a historical data of um, CO2 emissions versus uh, the CO2 content of uh, in the atmosphere. So the left axis, the left vertical axis shows the atmospheric CO2 in ppm parts per million. The right axis shows the uh, CO2 emissions in billions of tons, and you can see that the curves follow. So since 1750, this data has been collected, and we can see that in the um, late 1900s, you know, these two curves are following each other. So as we are um, um, creating more CO2, the uh, CO2 content in the air is going up, which is kind of makes sense. Okay, CO2 and global temperatures. So this chart shows a relationship between uh, CO2 content in the atmosphere and the atmospheric temperature. You can see as the CO2 concentration has been going up, the temperature has also been going up. Okay, this two charts show the, uh, the short-term and the uh, anthropogenic uh, increase in temperature or the temp global temperature projections. So the, here, uh, the chart shows from 1950 to 2100, and we will see that the, uh, according to different models, the temperature, uh, the CO2 uh, will go up in this, uh, according to this curve. And similarly, in, during the same period, the temperature will also go up along these curves. And these curves are different because different models are used to derive these curves. Okay, this is the anthropogenic temperature of the Earth. It goes back to 20,000 years. So 20,000 years ago, we had an ice age and when it was really cold and it started warming, uh, warming up and then it has gone through some mini cycles and then it went through a large heating period and then a cooling period. So it has gone through these cycles. So there was a little ice age in the 1800s, I believe. And now we are on the warming cycle. The uh, disturbing thing about this is that we are not seeing any end in sight. The curve is not tapering, which is just going up essentially exponentially. Uh, this is something I uh, stole from someone else's presentation. That's why it's a picture of a screen that I thought this was interesting, so I would share. So this also shows the anthropogenic uh, temperature rise. 
And uh, you can see it was cold during the ice age. Ice age was here. And then humans started cultivating. They started standing upright and started cultivating uh, crops. So the uh, following that, there was a slight decrease in global temperature. And then we started burning. We discovered fossil fuel. We started burning fossil fuel and the temperatures took off. So we are about here right now. And it's projected to go up here. Any questions so far? All right, moving on. So I've been asked, and many people, and also I have read many people ask, who cares that the global temperature is rising? You can just use some more AC. But, uh, you know, we have air conditioning cars, the buildings are air conditioned. Why do we even care? Why does it matter? Anyone venture to guess? Well, there are a lot of reasons. Uh, one is uh, temperature rise uh, and drought are going to cause crops to fail, which uh, could lead to uh, migration, uh, mass migration of people. And we're seeing that already from Central America and other places in Africa. So, I mean, that's just one little aspect of a problem. Human needs like uh, as temperature rises, the uh, food security will be jeopardized. And number one is habitable landmass. So, those are the two main reasons that the humans need. <laughs> So climate change and food production. So this uh, uh, this chart shows um, how global warming can affect uh, food crop losses. So uh, global warming can cause heavy rains, extreme weather, climate disruption, which can result in food crop losses. All right. These charts show food production. This is real data. Food production relative to temperature. So on the left chart shows the, the corn production uh, relative to uh, versus uh, temperature. And you can see as the temperature is cooler, Lost your microphone. With soybean, um, soybean production is higher when temperatures are uh, about four degrees cooler than the norm, and then they are lower when they are four degrees higher than the norm. Right. This chart shows the sea level rise um, over time versus um, and compared to or superimposed with uh, atmospheric CO2. So the horizontal axis shows the time, vertical axis on the left shows the CO2 content in PPNs, and the, on the right shows the global, uh, global sea levels rise. And you can see as the CO2 is rising, the sea levels are rising also. Okay, uh, this chart shows the sea level rise versus temperature. So um, the vertical axis is the temperature, the horizontal axis is the sea level rise, I believe. Let's see. And we can see the curve is as a positive slope. All right, so another question. So what the sea level rises a little bit. We will uh, just move on to higher ground. So this is a chart that shows that if all the ice, all the glaciers in the earth, have melted, how much land will be left? And you can see we will have maybe 40% of the land left, habitable land left. We lose most of the South America, we lose half of the United States, half of Africa, in a lot of Europe, 
most of Australia will be gone at the end of the world. Conclusions, CO2 is a greenhouse gas. Atmospheric CO2 causes global warming. Warmer temperatures reduce food production. Global warming causes sea level rise. Any questions? Uh, there's a question from uh, Nole. Uh, a billion people need to relocate. Probably more. Population is about 7 billion. If you lose half the land mass, we'll have a lot more people to relocate. Not only that, but majority of the people, more than 50% of the people live on the coastal area, which will be lost. All right, so path to sustainability. So what can we do in our personal lives to be sustainable or to help our civilization become sustainable? We can uh, consume less, that's one of the things we can do. But at this point, we live in an electric vehicle paradox. So we drive electric vehicles, we feel good about the, ourselves, but the reality is that we are burning coal to generate electricity, um, which is generating CO2 and pollution. So we need to get out of it. How do we do that? So this should be the future, the new reality in the new future, is we use renewables to generate electricity like solar, wind, hydro, geothermal, and then use that electricity to, uh, to charge our cars, and then, then we'll be sustainable. Now, how can we do it in a personal level? So, so batteries um, can be charged with solar energy. So you can use solar panels to charge batteries. It's obvious. Uh, this is a picture uh, of a student project uh, in Stanford, where they proved that you can use solar energy to uh, break water, break down water to generate hydrogen. So they show this uh, electrolysis process uh, and use solar panels to generate electricity to break hydrogen. So this is another way uh, you can generate hydrogen to drive EVs. Any questions? Uh, just just a comment. Uh, even if you uh, power your EV from coal, it's still more efficient than gasoline. If you consider that, uh, you know, the coal fire plants are at least 45% efficient and the motors are, what, 97% efficient, that's still better than the 30 some odd percent of a gasoline engine. So uh, even at 100%, you're still better off with an EV. Yes, you're correct. And, and I have an uh, example for you, Momin. I put 24 panels up on my roof and uh, I'm driving a Chevy Bolt and I've reduced my power bill down to less than $500 a year. Very good. How, how many kilowatt hour is the 24 panels? I'd have to look it up, but uh i can send that to you okay well i have i have two evs um nine kilowatts on the rooftop 9.6 kilowatts two tesla batteries i just disconnected from natural gas so my house is powered totally electrically my cars are powered electrically and last year i supplied six megawatt hours back to the electrical grid so you can be energy independent yourself if you if you do it. You're doing better than awesome. I am. Good job. All right, moving on. So path to zero emission transportation today. So this is what our previous uh, audience was talking about. So we can drive an EV. We can install rooftop solar, and make sure pay as little as possible. That is important. Because if you pay too much for a solar panel, the one thing is that you're gonna neutralize your uh, advantage of generating your own electricity. The other point is that if you pay too much for your solar, you're generating 
more economic activity in, uh, by increasing the profit of the company that's installing. Now you have to remember that every dollar that's spent in the economy has a carbon footprint. So if you generate more profit for the company, you essentially increase the carbon footprint uh, in a global scale. So just remember that. So negotiate well. If you drive 12,000 miles per year or 33 miles a day, then you can install two kilowatt hour batteries for charging the car. The cost of a two kilowatt um, system is about $5,300 with rebate. Um, scale up if you drive more. Okay, solar power for sustainable future. For a 12,000 12, mile per year commute, an EV will need two kilowatt hour solar system. So a uh, two kilowatt hour uh, solar system uh, has a footprint of 13.3 square meters or 143 square foot. A typical 2000 square foot home has a 2500 square foot of roof area. So you have plenty of roof areas. For a family of four with two EVs would need to install four kilowatt hour solar system. Add another four kilowatt hour system for household electric use. So eight kilowatt hour system uh, has a footprint of 572 square foot. Cost of eight kilowatt hour solar system is $22,000 with rebates. This will eliminate electric and gasoline bill for 15 to 20 years. $22,000 loan for 15 years with 3.25 interest will have a monthly payment of $154. So you can do the math for your own family's needs and make a decision. This is just a high level guideline. Any questions? Okay, moving on. So this is an interesting subject, EVs and financial markets. All right, so there are several EV manufacturers in the market. Tesla is the big kahuna. It has the highest market valuation among all vehicle manufacturers. Uh, it makes cars, SUVs, there's GM, which makes Chevy Bolt. So they're coming up with GMC Hummer. There's Nissan, which is a Japanese car company that has had Leaf for a while. Toyota, another Japanese company that has had the F4 PS Prime. Honda, another Japanese manufacturer, which has Clarity. There is Neo, which is a Chinese manufacturer. And then there is Volkswagen. So Neo is a, has an interesting technology. They have opted to uh, incorporate replaceable batteries in their cars. So um, that makes a lot of sense because they are um, shooting towards having standardized batteries in every car, every electric car, and you will be able to go to a station and just um, replace your battery so you don't have a charge, uh, charging time. So they are eliminating the charging time by replacing batteries, which makes a lot of sense to me. Um, in the Beijing Olympics, they tried this concept. So they had these electric buses that were doing circles between the uh, Olympic Village and the various sites. Um, and these buses uh, had batteries on their roof and the buses would go through a, uh, a battery changing uh, station and uh, they won't even have to stop. They would just drive slowly and a robotic arm would just slide the battery, old battery out and a, a new battery would be placed in its location and then off they go. So that worked really well. And Neo is incorporating that um, concept in their cars. Okay, so Tesla is the big kahuna. The NASDAQ symbol for Tesla is TSLA. Its market cap is $586 billion. This is kind of outdated. Its PE is 995. PE essentially means price to earning ratio. 
the lower the better and it is really high that tells you that wall street is willing to pay a lot more for an ev than they are willing to pay for a traditional car company so uh gm's pe is in nine uh, and uh, tesla's pe is 995 so uh, tesla is essentially uh, 100 times more expensive tesla stocks are 100 times more expensive than a gm stock so uh the uh, principal characteristics of a Tesla is, is stylish, it has multiple models, long range, good quality. Okay, other manufacturers, GM, it has the LTM battery, it says uh, established manufacturer, it has commitment to go all electric in 20 years. Toyota, one of the largest, one of the two largest companies, uh, it is an established manufacturer. Uh, it has hybrid experience and it is known for good quality. NIO is a startup Chinese company, low cost, replaceable batteries. Nissan is an established manufacturer, early entry. Volkswagen, established manufacturer, well funded, so they can put a lot of money in research and development. BMW, established manufacturer, well funded, luxury market. So BMW is going towards the luxury market. Kia, established manufacturer, well-funded, low cost. Workhorse is an interesting story, even though their stocks haven't done, uh, done poorly lately. Um, Workhorse is a company that is uh, targeting the um, delivery van market. So they are targeting the vans, uh, UPS vans and Amazon vans. So they have another piece of technology, which is uh, drones. So uh, their business model is that they're going to um, supply the delivery companies like UPS and uh, US Postal Service and Amazon with these uh, electric delivery vans, which will also have drone incorporated. So they can come and park in a neighborhood and send the packages via drone to all the, all the houses in that neighborhood. So that will actually reduce cost. So that is their technology. Um, Ride is another startup uh, that is uh, targeting commercial trucks. Nikola is a startup which uh, is targeting semi tractor trailers, electric semi tractor trailers. And Fisker, uh, Fisker Karma is a startup which is targeting electric sports cars. Among battery manufacturers, there's Tesla's lithium ion, lithium ion cobalt battery. GM has its Ultium battery, which is essentially a lithium ion battery, which is with a different form factor. Their electrodes, electrodes are not wrapped on an axis. Their electrodes are sheets, which are laid on top of each other. LG Chemical is the big battery manufacturer. Uh, and uh, there is Panasonic. Panasonic is another one of those large um, battery manufacturers. Among uh, startups, QuantumScape has got a lot of buzz lately because they have uh, been promoting or working on solid state lithium ion battery. Uh, there is a company called StoreDot. Their claim to fame is fast charging lithium ion flash battery. There is NOM. They are, um, their claim to fame is safety, non-flammable electrolytes. There's a company named Lithium Works. Uh, it's working on lithium, cobalt oxide cathode and a graphite anode battery. And then there is Ferradion, which is working on sodium ion technology. So uh, the last one is interesting because apparently Sodium and lithium have uh, similar char chemical characteristics. And at one point, some scholars wrote paper that if we were to convert all the vehicles in the world into electric vehicles, we won't have enough lithium to make the batteries. So, uh, so a group of scientists started working on sodium ion batteries. And, and we know that there is plenty of sodium on Earth because salt is made out of sodium. So 
So uh, in the future, there may be a mix. So there may be lithium ion batteries and sodium ion batteries also. All right, quantum scape, uh, its market cap is 17 billion. Its PE is negative 48, so it's burning money right now. Uh, it has no sales and its uh, claim to fame is solid state lithium ion battery. Any questions? Uh, there was a comment from uh, Doug that uh, Ford is delivering electric pickups. And a question from uh, Noe, is there any work being done on aluminum batteries? That's point. Yes, Ford uh, announced that they're going to be uh, building Ford vehicles, which is going to be at 40,000 price range, which caused the workhorse stocks to crash because workhorses uh, uh, ride, sorry, ride is, um, working on trucks also. So ride stocks crashed when Ford announced because Ford obviously has a, a loyal customer base and they can also build quality trucks. Um, whereas ride is a new startup. So yes, uh, Ford is planning on delivering Ford trucks in near future. However, ride is about nine, it's supposed to be about nine months ahead of Ford. Uh, what was the other question? Aluminum batteries? Yeah, Sorry. aluminum batteries. Sorry, I don't know. Do you have any have questions? Feel free to email me. Uh, I think Daron sends the announcement. So if you send an email to Daron, he'll forward it to me. Yeah, happy to do. Uh, one, another question here. Uh, actually, a couple more. One I actually missed from earlier. Sorry about that. Um, uh, it's from Joanne. What about methane? I believe that was in the context of uh, methane versus hydrogen. Methane as a, not sure whether the question is about methane as a global. Uh, Warming gas or methane as a fuel? So methane as a global warming gas is really bad. It, it has, I think, 20 times the ability to retain heat than CO2. So we don't want methane in atmosphere. And one of the. Uh, yeah, she, she, she clarified. Yeah, you know, she was asking about global warming gas. Methane is bad news. And uh, one of the distressing. Uh, information is that as globe is warming, the permafrost in, uh, in the uh, Arctic regions uh, is melting or warming up. And permafrost has a lot of uh, methane trapped inside in a frozen form. So as those are being released into the atmosphere, that is accelerating the global warming also. And at, at JPL, there was a team of scientists that went to um, Siberia, I believe, to study this. And there's a video where they show that the bubbles are rising uh, through the uh, water that used to be ice has melt, uh, melted, has melted. And these bubbles uh, rise from the bottom and come through the, uh, come through the water, and I guess gets released in the air. And they took a match and held it on top of the water and it basically combusted and the water started burning. Oh. All right, uh, question from uh, Lauren. Uh, I heard it takes an order of magnitude more water to put out an EV fire compared to an ice fire. Is uh, NOHM my, let me try that again. Will NOHM mitigate this fire danger? Repeat that question. Uh, I heard it takes an order of magnitude or water to put out an EB fire compared to an uh, ICE fire. Will NOHM mitigate this fire danger? What is NOHM? Uh, I was hoping you do. <laughs> okay, okay. So they're talking about this, this company. Yes. Yes. So I think they are. I didn't read too much into their 
companies, uh, business, or the technology, but they are talking about using different types of electro electrolytes to reduce the uh, the flammability of the batteries. Uh, comment from uh, John. Uh, mentioned Rivian truck and SUV maker. Ford invested in them, and they decided to go on their own after they learned uh, from Rivian. Rivian also has a contract with FedEx for delivery vehicles. They're due to start delivery at the end of 2022. Rivian is a competitive workhorse in the delivery vehicle. Not sure whether they are publicly traded or not, but uh, Rivian also has a contract with Amazon, so so they may end up to be the winners in uh, in the delivery vehicle market. So I believe they are not publicly traded. That's why I didn't list it here. And he John clarifies. Uh, we meant to say uh, end of this year, start of next year. That is all I see in the chat and Q&A windows. Well, thank you all for listening. It was a, my pleasure to. Uh, um, a couple more questions that, that come in moment. Um, uh, one from Joe, how, how low should you avoid draining a lithium ion battery and cell phone to keep an extended life? A uh, couple of things. One thing is that the cell phones have a uh, protection circuit that prevents the battery from going all the way down to 0%. So a cell phone already has some margin. So uh, I don't know what that is. It probably varies from phone to phone. Uh, however, according to the plots, uh, we should avoid going below 40, below 50%, I think. If you can stay above 50%, uh, you can get majority of the cycles that it is designed for. All right. Uh, question from uh, Beirut. What are the prospects of through the road charging as EVs move, given that such an approach will, will reduce the needed battery size? Uh, th through the road. Oh, you would have to kind of ride them on tracks, maybe. I like, uh, unless he's talking about the roads being electrified with electrodes to supply electricity, or are we using the momentum to charge the battery? Not clear on that question. Okay, they're already starting to put in. Um, experimental patches of piezoelectric material in the roads to generate electricity. I haven't heard of anybody charting, trying to uh, charge a vehicle from the road. So that's a good good point. I, I believe in China or Singapore, they have a mall where they install piezoelectric uh, devices that uh, supply electricity to diodes. So as people walk um, on the mall, the floor lights up and provides light. So I suppose that is the concept that they're talking about is that as cars, the weight of the car will push the piezo devices, which will generate electricity, which will be then stored in a battery somewhere. And then, uh, then another car can come and charge the their car with the with that with that charge. So that is feasible. I don't know how cost effective it is, but it is feasible. Any other questions? Um, a moment. Let me elaborate on my question. I was thinking in terms of. A wireless charging, which is already a reality for small devices. Is that going to be feasible anytime in future for cars? So, but I 
wireless charging is inefficient. And that is the problem. Because if we lose 10% of the energy to space uh, due to coupling losses, uh, then that kind of negates the whole sustainability argument. So, uh, so that would be my answer. But yeah, yeah it is well, probably possible, yeah. but. <laughs> well, you do lose some lost. energy, but also if that reduces the weight of the car, by 50% because you don't need the bulky battery, you recover some of that energy. Oh, I see. You are saying that wirelessly charging on the move? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I think it's far out in the distant future, but, uh, but this is something I can say is that by the time we get to this concept of reducing the battery, the, uh, the the battery technology will have improved to a point where we will not need this concept to be implemented. Okay. And, and just so you're aware, there's at least two manufacturers that are talking about having uh, wireless recharging of their cars in your parking lot, a garage, or or at work. That part makes sense because you're, you know, instead of plugging, you plugging it, you get you get charged to the air. So the only thing that is saving is the inconvenience of, of having to plug the car, which I'm not sure whether that has enough financial incentive to spend a lot of you know, research money into. And the electromagnetic field for that would, I would think would be a little unnerving. Also remember the one over R squared losses. We're the, we're the electromagnetic group here. You know, every distance between your magnetic coupler and your car, you're losing one over R squared of energy loss over that transmission uh, path. And so it was a moment you said, you've got that efficiency going hit, going against you. So I'm not buying it, but maybe the rest of you will. I, I think we shouldn't be that lazy that we can plug the car. You know? Convenience is good, but it has... It has its limits. Any other questions or comments? Good job. Thanks, Norman. Thank you. How did I do for time? Uh, uh, sorry, there's a uh, one more. There's a quote from uh, uh, a comment from Dennis. It's a quote from uh, uh, John Kerry. Uh, even if the US emits no more CO2, the global temperature will still rise to 95% of projected temps. 30% uh, of, of pollution is coming from China, and there's India and Russia. Uh, climate change is a State Department problem to negotiate. Yeah, that's probably true. And, uh, and you know, this problem is so large. And recently I was listening to a talk by a uh, by a person who does this environmental studies, uh, they mentioned something which was a little depressing. <laughs> they said that we have already gone beyond the point of no return, which was, I believe, in 2007. Um, now it's just a matter of slowing the curve. So, so yeah, uh, we, uh, as a nation, we probably don't have as much control as we used to because now the other countries are polluting a lot also. However, uh, just because of that fact, we can't just give up and drive our hummers to work. Uh, we have to, as human beings and as a member of uh, human race, we should do our part. So, so, so we should do what we can and uh, see what happens. Any other questions, comments? Uh, nothing in the, in the chat or Q and A window. Okay, with that, I think we can end this talk. I think we went a little bit over, but I think that's good enough. Thank you all for listening.
Thank you, Mama. Thank you. Thank you.